The past few weeks I've been talking a ton about the PlayStation Vita. I recently got one, been playing it quite a bit, and overall have really enjoyed it, and I understand why that passionate fan base is still stuck around, but I've owned a Vita-capable console I often say for quite some time and that was the PlayStation TV. I bought this when they were being clearanced out for something like 20 or 30 dollars and I really bought it just for the reason that it came with DualShock 3 controller. At the time my PS3 I had like just one controller so for that price it was worth it for the DualShock controller for my PS3 on its own but the PlayStation TV was a system that was designed to play Vita games running the Vita OS but doing so on a TV which due to the fact that the Vita had a touch screen did create some complications. So while it was able to navigate with the DualShock 3 and many games were playable with the DualShock 3, some Vita games do require touch screen or other different motion control elements that simply weren't able to be replicated on the PlayStation TV and as a result some games are blacklisted and not playable on the PlayStation TV though there are mods that can overcome this and open up other games to work because some of these games the fact that they weren't PlayStation TV compatible didn't really make any sense while other games maybe if they were reliant on the camera the motion controls whatnot that couldn't be replicated in the PlayStation TV are just outright unplayable on this system and while the idea of playing Vita games on a system that costs $100 which the time was significantly cheaper than buying a PlayStation Vita itself and later the PlayStation TV would drop even far below $100 like I said I paid 30 maybe they bottomed out at $20 I mean they were getting clearance off pretty cheap Today, it's a very expensive console as it became somewhat of a niche collector's item. You could also play your PSP and PS1 games on your TV this way. And while PSP games have been playable at the time on your TV for a while due to the video output cord that could be plugged into the 2000 and 3000 PSP models, this would do so in a bit of a larger form factor where you wouldn't have to worry about that letterbox. But let's not dodge around the fact that Vita games and PSP games don't look nearly as good on a television as they do in the palm of your hand, blowing them up onto a huge TV was no doubt about to expose some of the lower resolutions that these games ran in when you had them blown up on such a large display. Outside of the PS2 Slim, which got down to pretty close to $100, if not $100, back in its day when it was on its way out and replaced by the PS3 already, Sony has not sold many consoles for quite this cheap of a price point, just $100 at MSRP. Of course, they sold the PlayStation Classic at that price, and that too got run down into much lower clearance prices over time because ultimately it wasn't successful. However, unlike the PlayStation Classic, which came with a preset selection of 20 games and could be technically modded to add more, the PlayStation Vita TV had a much larger library, and maybe the idea of calling it the PlayStation Vita TV, like I accidentally did here, might have helped its case because a lot of people were left very confused with what the PlayStation TV actually was. I mean, overall, it just resembled it's a little tiny micro console, something like an Ouya or a Game Stick, which are some of these other tiny micro consoles coming out at the time. Those games played Android games that were modified to work with controllers, and when you compare that to what was available on the PlayStation TV, it definitely would have had the upper hand, but there was a lot of consumer confusion over what exactly this was, because as a tiny micro console, you might have thought that it would be great for streaming and different media platforms, but ultimately, because the Vita did not have a ton of these media apps, neither did the PlayStation TV, and it just did not have quite as wide of an array of media apps as it really needed to be successful successful on that front. Instead, it seems like over time, Sony tried to position this not as a system that you would own alongside your PlayStation Vita to play your PlayStation Vita games on. They tried to sell it instead to people that owned a PlayStation 4, which I personally at the time did not, because the PlayStation 4 players could use the PS4 Link capabilities that the Vita had, which allowed you to play the PS4 games in the palm of your hand over a connection within a proximity of your PlayStation 4 to not play the games in the palm of your hand, but rather play them on a different TV. So if you had your PlayStation 4 connected to one TV, say in your living room, you could have a PlayStation TV in your bedroom, and you could connect wirelessly to your PlayStation 4 to play that PlayStation 4 game in your bedroom, though your PlayStation 4 was not in the room. You were playing instead on this tiny little micro console. Of course, connecting to a game in this way does create some delays and other sort of latency that would just be better off to probably avoid and play the game in the room where the system actually is located. 
I understand that the Vita did not have a ginormous install base by any means, but I think that approaching this as an add-on sort of for the PlayStation 4 was a mistake and should have instead been the product, the opportunity to get your Vita games playing on your TV in a way where progress would actually sync between the handheld and the TV, a sort of Switch-like experience. And while today there is a Vita dock that you can purchase or create yourself that can get your Vita connected to your TV so that you can play these games on your television, including even being able able to pair up a DualShock 3 controller with the Vita if you're just to leave the dock sitting on your countertop. But the reality is, if they could have had this piece of hardware and the Vita function in a way where game saves synced across both devices seamlessly so you can play a game on your TV, then play the game on the go after you got the save file synced through Wi-Fi. And you can technically do this if you have both systems modded just by FTPing between the two, the save files, but having to navigate that is a hassle. And I'm kind of surprised that there is no homebrew software to do this yet that maybe just FTPs the most recent save file that you had open on the TV onto your mobile device. So you constantly have have those files staying up to date in a sort of FTP based emulation of cloud saves. Today if you're somebody that's interested in trying out a PlayStation TV or just playing a wide variety of Vita games, don't do it on the PlayStation TV. I think that would be a mistake. Instead, I think pick yourself up a PlayStation Vita if you haven't already, and then look into either purchasing or building your own Vita dock, because ultimately, that really is the way to go when you consider that the PlayStation TV is exceptionally more expensive than it was even when it retailed at originally $100. If you'd been able to pick up one for $20, $30 back in the day, I think that would have been a heck of a deal, and I wish I'd have been more active on YouTube at the time to tell people about what I honestly think was one of the best values in gaming hardware of all time because when I was making videos more frequently like this I was talking about the PlayStation Classic as that kind of sort of best value when you're paying like $20, $30 for the system that could be modded and basically emulate a Raspberry Pi in a really cool case that already came with controllers. It was just a great value. And I think that the PlayStation TV did that one better by having Wi-Fi connectivity and just a wider range of games available for it in addition to just being more powerful than the PlayStation Classic in general. Thank you guys for watching. I'm Bailey, and I will see you in the next video.